you would typically see out there. If you just said, I want Lewis structure practice, what could I find? These would be very, very common things that would pop up. So um, just in case you can't see that, the, the handwriting very well just because of the glare, what we're looking at is BCL3 for that first one. What's our process? Ideally, no one would look at what's there for, the, for that. We just want to know, move through our process for how we would do it. And then the work that's shown here is great. And ideally, that's what we'd be looking for for paper homework. So if you're wondering for the paper homework due Friday, this, this is Sunday. Sunday. Is it really Sunday? That's what Canvas says. Okay. I mean, it's whatever Canvas says is what it is. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, this is perfectly acceptable for paper homework. I would argue three questions is what we're highlighting right here. Okay, of our, did I say 20? Yeah. Okay, just checking. What's our first step? Total valence electrons. Valence electrons. So we look at boron. How many valence electrons does boron have? Three. It's in that third column, so we're looking at three. Chlorine. Seven. And I'm actually going to tell you to hold because you already worked through most of this, so I actually don't want you participating. No, it was I know, but that's part of the awkwardness of trying to deal with this. Chlorine, we see where chlorine is. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? Seven. Seven. Let's see? There's three. There's three of them, so we want to multiply by three. Seven times three oh. is 34. 21. Just checking. 21. 21 plus three gets us our 24. We can pick our center atom. Boron versus chlorine. Which one is closer to fluorine? Chlorine is, which means chlorine should be on the outside. Boron should be in the middle. So we'll put our boron as our center atom. We can put our chlorines around on the outside. Did we talk through the square thing, right? Yeah. Okay. You don't have to show the square on there at all. That's just kind of something I will do to help kind of emphasize it. Um, we now need to scatter our electrons. We just established that chlorine was the more electronegative. So we'll start placing our electrons around the chlorine. I like to place them first in the space where I know they need to be, which would be the formation of that bond. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Okay. We've placed them in pairs around each of those atoms to satisfy the octet for that atom before we move on to the next atom for placing electrons. We keep adding those electrons until we've achieved our total valence, which we said was 24. So we're at 24, so we can't add any more electrons. Now to simplify our drawing, any place that we have a pair of electrons between atoms, we... sometimes the screen wigs out on me. That wasn't me intentionally, for the record. Um, a pair of electrons between atoms I can turn into a line, and we have those bonds. Okay. What was the next step? Checking octets. We did all the chlorines, so assuming we didn't start venturing out into weird space, our chlorines should be satisfied. We could go in and check our boron. The boron does not have an octet. It needs eight electrons. We currently have six. So what do we do? Take some from chlorine. Take some from one of the chlorines. So I can take a pair from that chlorine and I put it on the boron and now we're happy. No. Why not? Because now the chlorine does not have eight. Okay, so somehow or another I have to place that pair of electrons that I took from chlorine in a way that both the chlorine and the boron have access. I'll place it in between the atoms and I now have a double bond. Did I have to use the chlorine on the right? No. Did I have to use the chlorine on the bottom? Did I have to use the chlorine on the left? Nope. Which means? Resonance. Resonance, and I should be showing all three drawings to be most correct. Make sense? All right. So what we've added there is a layer for resonance. I don't want to go through and draw all the structures. What, and I would argue for your notes sake, you could just say plus resonance structures on an exam. You should be showing them. If you're like, but I'm short on time, say plus resonance structures. You're acknowledging that you know the content, 
but you're saying I've written too long of a test and you can't finish it all, you're now putting the ball in my court to take points away from you. Okay? More than likely, I would say, okay, I understand what you're saying. You're saying plus resonance structures. You just didn't want to draw all of them. Depending on how important I think it is to draw them, I might take off points. I might not. Okay? But you've at least provided yourself a defensible position. If you don't say plus resonance structures, I don't know that you know that content. You absolutely will lose points. Make sense? Okay. Any questions? Regarding to that? Or yes. Because I'm acting like we're done with it, right? definitely acting like we're done with it, but we're not. We forgot our last step. So there's two big steps that come in for OCHEM that we have to be aware of that are kind of different from what we did in CHEM 130, and that's dealing with resonance, which we've now addressed, and formal charge. Formal charge also needs to be addressed, which means you have to go through and look at each atom to assign formal charge. For those people being, but the molecule is neutral, there shouldn't be any charge. There shouldn't be any charge in the molecule. There can be charge on individual atoms. Okay? This is where if we knew our bonding patterns, we would have some shortcuts. If we don't know our bonding patterns, we would have to go through and calculate our formal charge. Okay? How do we calculate formal charge? Minus bonds. Okay? You can do bonding electrons. The problem with calling it bonding electrons is then you must also divide by two. And I don't like doing the division. So I just say the number of bonds. Okay? So if we look at the chlorine that I'm pointing an arrow to, chlorine has how many valence? Seven. Seven minus non bonding electrons. Six. Six minus the number of bonds. One. One. And we get an overall charge of. Zero, which means I don't have to specify any charge on that chlorine, which means the bottom chlorine I will also not have to specify a charge on. Immediately, I should be screaming in my head, oh, the chlorine, the other chlorine that has a different bonding pattern probably has a charge. Okay? So I could go through and look at that one. Chlorine comes in with how many valence electrons? Seven, Seven minus the number of bonds. Two. Two minus the number of non-bonding electrons. Four, and we get one. one. Most important part when dealing with the charge is not necessarily the size of the charge, the magnitude, the number. I don't care about that. I care about the, the sign, positive or negative. Because in most cases for OCHEM, we're looking at either positive one or negative one, and that is it. So we don't care if it's two or three. It can happen. We just don't see it as often. Okay. So when we do this math, it's not so much that it's 1, it's that it's positive 1, and I should be specifying near that chlorine a plus 1, or really just a single positive sign. I don't have to worry about the number. Make sense? If we move through with the boron, boron has how many valence electrons? 3. 3 minus 0 minus 4, four and we get a negative one, we should be putting a charge on the boron. Okay. That should then go through in all of our resonance structures as well. We should make sure we address all of those charges because that makes them a complete structure. Now what we've got is a complete structure. We could be okay. The could be gets into the last kind of nuanced part with Lewis structure on deciding best versus useful and all of those kind of fun nuances. If we look up the formula or Lewis structure for this compound, almost universally what you will see online will be the structure with only single bonds. Okay. Why? The why has a lot to do with how we would predict the chemistry to fall out. Okay. And so by showing it with all single bonds, 
it helps us to see that boron wants more electrons, that we could put more electrons into it to satisfy its octet, and that can explain its reactivity. If we show it in the other case with the charges in the double bond, it kind of hides it, because now I have a negative charge on that boron. Well, it doesn't want more electrons, so how does it react? And so it kind of hides some of the chemistry. So depending on what we're trying to do, we would draw either of those in different scenarios. Again, most of the time what we're trying to do is show chemistry, and so we would pick the top structure with all single bonds. If we're trying to show Lewis structure, which this question is, we should really be showing the charge state. Okay, kind of makes sense? Okay. For everybody saying, yes, that makes sense, I would argue it doesn't. That's kind of obnoxious. What we're saying is, depending on the scenario we're looking at, we're either right or we're wrong for the exact same answer. All right, that's not particularly cool. Unfortunately, that's the boat that we're in. Okay? At this stage, you should be drawing octets. That is our focus. We should maximize octets. Okay? When we go through and look at ranking different Lewis structures, the very first rule on deciding whether or not we have a good Lewis structure is octet. Okay. After octet comes charges. Okay. So we could fix these charges by taking the electrons and putting it back on the chlorine. The boron goes neutral, the chlorine would become neutral, and we'd have this structure. But then we'd invalidate our first rule for good structures, which is octets. Make sense? So they kind of compete against each other, and that's the unfortunate line that we're in. Make sense? If we move to the next one, CCl4, okay, we'd be doing the same kind of pattern moving through all of that. Okay? I don't really want to walk through that one. In fact, the next two I don't want to walk through. I don't want to do CCl4 or the B, um, BR5 through details. Okay? CCl4 should be a straightforward one. There's nothing tricky there. Where I will mention something being tricky is that last one. And this becomes one of the problems with you finding your own questions on Lewis structure. Okay. What's happening in this last one is PBr5. If we go through all the process in totaling up electrons, we're going to get valence electrons, numbers, all that fun work, 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 work. And what you'll end up with is the structure that your classmate has shown, more or less. And we would get or should get something along these lines, okay, with all of our electrons around, yada, 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 yada. What is the problem that we have with this potential structure? Or do you have a problem with it? The phosphorus has more than eight. Yeah, the phosphorus has exceeded its octet. We don't like exceeding octets. In OCHEM, we can't deal with it. We're mentally incapable of dealing with exceeded octets. That's because the vast majority of time, the elements that we are working with are in our second row, okay, or even that last column. Okay, and within those scenarios, we stick pretty safely to just eight electrons, octet, for sure with the second row. As soon as we hit the third row, things go wonky. Why do they go wonky? If we go back to our electron configurations, for our first energy level, what orbitals do we have? We have our s orbital. For our second energy level, what do we have? We have the 2s and the 2p. For our third energy level, what do we have? The 3s, the 3p, and the 3d. Note, not in the fourth row, or in the third row, but that has to do with other things that we don't need to discuss, those d orbitals complicate the bonding patterns for anything third energy level or lower, uh, depending on how you want to talk about it, or third, fourth, fifth, sixth energy levels. The d orbitals mess with how atoms interact with each other, and it allows them to expand octets. But again, if we go back and look at what we're setting with an OCHEM, we don't care. <laughs> There's giant black boxes over those reasons, or over those areas, which is one of the reasons why we don't need to worry about it. Okay? 
So if you're drawing something out and you're like, why am I exceeding an octet? This looks weird. It's because you've accidentally stumbled into a question that is outside the scope of what we need for this course. Okay? This comes the challenge with assigning questions. Make sense? Okay. You could still draw it depending on how you wanted to go through and do it. And if you wanted to count that as practice, that's fine. The, I'm, I'm not going to take points away from that. Just realize you're, you're not doing what you need to. Okay? Or what's potentially useful. How do we fix that? Well, the way we would fix that, I would argue, is that your instructor needs to tell you potential questions to look at. Okay? I'm finally catching up with that. Okay? And if we look within Canvas, I have, as of this morning, created a Unit 1 Suggested Questions. So what I went through and did is referenced or found questions that I knew was an available source. So the McMurray OpenStax, which I've also linked within text information. Um, for everything for unit one, reference the chapter one questions, roughly what the topics are talking about within those questions, and the questions that could go with them. Okay? And I'm going to try and go through and do that for all of the topics that we're addressing. I'll be moving into chapter two, hopefully later today, um, and then probably three and four. For people wondering where we're at, kind of moving within that textbook, yeah, we're about four. We got about four chapters worth of content within the first exam. The first four chapters, based on what I did looking through them, are mostly okay. Um, they are going into things in a little bit more detail than I would like. Um, but they aren't horrible. So if we go through and look at our reading resources, okay, again, I tried to break it down. Atomic structure, molecules, resonance, alkanes and drawings, cycloalkanes and drawings. All of those content areas are this unit. Okay? If we look at what we've addressed, we did atomic structure. Okay? We've done molecules, we've done resonance, we've done a little bit with drawings. This alkanes and cycloalkanes is probably gonna be next week because what we need to do is get a little bit back at our atomic structure with our molecules and look at hybridization theory, which is kind of my goal for today, is to give you a little bit more understanding behind that. Remember we talked about sigma versus pi, and I just said just kind of run with it, accept that that's what we're calling it for the moment. We need to address where those things are coming from. That's hopefully what we'll cover today so that we have those fundamentals that we can now start to build on, or at least the common language. Make sense? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Really good question. Um, it needs to be published soon. Um, again, that's a big goal, is trying to get week three published today, worst case tomorrow. Um, I don't want it being published any later than the Friday before. So that is that is my goal, is to get that up there. Um, what that week three is, the holdup on the week three is the active homework because the active homework is supposed to be due um, within week three. Um, and that was the table flipping moments of trying to select questions that it kept then deleting my entire assignment on. Um, that's the, the holdup, because the overall skeleton is the same. So if we go through and look at it, all of the, the content delivery stuff is there for week three. There's no play pause it videos, for better or worse. It's really just going to be our lecture, our supplemental reading. I've got to insert the suggested problems. I haven't done that yet. And then you'll see an extra thing for the active, but I have to build that. So I'm hoping to have that done today, and then I can publish it. The lecture content for it, oh, I thought I had it opened. Um, it, you already have access to. So you could look at the slides and be like, oh, that's, that's this week. I think I've got it here. Yeah. So yeah, what I'm not positive on, but I'm a little confident on, is that all of the slides that I've posted for unit one is everything for unit one. 
We're not going to go veering off into different topics. These topics are them. So if we look at where we're kind of at, scrolling through this, holy cow, there's 102 slides. Um, we looked at our resonance. We looked at kind of our structures, which we didn't cover this, but it's only just an, an answer thing. Um, we'll talk about our drawing molecules, our simplifications, which again, we should be kind of already used to review. Representing molecules, you've already seen. And then we're getting into our hybridization stuff. Okay. After hybridization stuff, now what we're looking at is kind of some functionality. What does it mean when we put those things together? Which then brings in the need for nomenclature. So we'll see some naming stuff in the video for the end of this week. And then we're looking at our representations of our alkanes and our cycloalkanes, which would be theoretically next week. With an exam hitting week four, the Thursday of week four. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's scale up the difficulty a little bit. With our Lewis structures, we kind of picked kind of simple things. There was a clear center atom. Provide a structure for C3H8O. Okay. So we need three carbons, eight hydrogens, and a single oxygen. I want a structure for that. Figure out a way that you can put that together. Okay. And what you will probably find is all of those Lewis structure rules I gave you kind of fall apart. Okay. Because without a clear center atom, it makes it difficult to build that out. But see what you can come up with. If you've got questions, let me know. I'll come to you. So initially, the slide had this draw the Lewis structure for CH4 and NH3. And I see a lot of people drawing those, which isn't necessarily bad. But the focus needs to be C3H8O. If we go through and do CH4, hopefully what you would note is that your carbon has four bonding groups, which sets you up with a pattern. When we go through and deal with carbon, how many bonds should it have? Four. So when we go through and look at the formula for C3H8O, what we could go through and do is start with our process. Instead of all that counting of valence electrons, we could go through and say, my carbon has to have four bonds. If I put four hydrogens around it, would that work? Well, I have another carbon. Could I bond another carbon next to that hydrogen? Can I do that? No. 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 I saw your head shake no first. Why? Uh, because it's a hydrogen. Hydrogen can only have one bond. Ultimately, it can only have two electrons around it. If we have those two lines, we're now saying that hydrogen has four electrons around it. It can't do that. Okay? Which means that was a bad guess. So I can't have four hydrogens around that first carbon, which means I have to have one of those bonds hanging off and connect to what? Carbon. I could connect it to carbon. Okay, so put another carbon there. How many bonds should that carbon have? Four. Four. How many do we see? One. So what should we do? Have three more. What things could I now attach to that? What things could I attach to that? What things could I attach to that? Every time you hit a dead end, we're like, oh, I put on all the hydrogens, but now I can't add another thing because hydrogen can't expand. That's now a possibility. Okay? And so what you're trying to do is slowly piece your way through based off of, theoretically, the common bonding patterns that you picked up from doing a ton of Lewis practice. Okay? You may have not have done a ton of Lewis practice. And remember, that's, that's all my fault. But I did point out that common bonding pattern process that we need, right? which is why I'm doubling back to the carbon to show, highlight that. So again, we'll spend a little bit longer trying to draw out that possible structure. I'll grab everybody's attention real quickly because I heard reference to a right direction. Okay? This is a really important concept to get across. This is where the model kits come into play. Okay? Right direction. Are we ready for this? Fun little assignment that I like to do for everybody in class. What is my name? Mike. 
What's my name now? How about now? How about now? Does the identity change based off of what you see? No. So what is the right direction? There is no right direction. That is insanely challenging to deal with. Okay? That becomes one of the big problems within OCHEM is we try to lock on to a right direction. There isn't a right direction. There's only correct ways to draw your bonding patterns. As long as your bonding patterns are there, your structure is correct. There is no directionality with where it is located. Let's go ahead. Within our drawing, we've got our carbon. We got that next carbon. It needs three bonds or three more things connected to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a hydrogen. I'm gonna draw a hydrogen. I'm gonna draw an oxygen. Oxygen, according to what I have learned based off the slides that says I need to know my bonding patterns on, should have two bonds. There's oxygen's second bond. That second bond is gonna go to not hydrogen, because if it goes to hydrogen, what becomes the problem? You can't go anymore. I can't go anymore, and I know I have another carbon, so I'm gonna draw Stop it. another carbon. Within that carbon, I will now go through and show its four bonds out to hydrogens. How many carbons have I drawn? Three. Three. How many hydrogens have I drawn? Eight. Eight. How many oxygens have I drawn? One. One. Do all, are all of my octets satisfied? No. Oxygen. The oxygen is missing its octet. This is where I could call up a couple different things. Okay. The long process of what I could call up was remember that this is Lewis structure and I have to account for all the valence electrons. Well, all the valence electrons, there were three carbons. Each of those carbons has four valence electrons times three, which equals 12. Hydrogen, there's eight, or each of them has one. There's eight of them, which means I get eight. The oxygen, there's one. There's six electrons there. That's 26. If I go through and count out my pairs, I get two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, I need 26. How do I fix that? Add them on the oxygen. 24, 26. And I now have an oxygen with a complete octet. Perfectly satisfied and good. Okay. The other approach, instead of counting out all the valence electrons and figuring out how many electrons have been put in there already through those common bonding patterns, was to have spent the time to have memorized that slide, which we'll double back to, but I don't want to delete all my work, that oxygen in its neutral state has two bonds and two lone pairs to satisfy its octet. That's its common bonding pattern. Why it's its common bonding pattern, we're going to look at in potentially here in a second. So this would then be the answer for provide a structure for C3H8O. Some people are potentially even smiling at this. How many of you drew that structure? Not a single one of you. Okay, does that mean you all are wrong? No. No. What does it mean? There's many different ways to draw it. There are multiple ways to draw this formula. This is partly why I ask for you to draw structures for this formula. So I want you to recognize that formulas are useless. Right? The only thing formulas call attention to is the amount of atoms that are present in that compound, but it says nothing about where those atoms are located. Does the location change how it interacts with the world? Yeah. Absolutely, we need to be looking at structures, not at formulas. That is a huge brain shift. Okay? If you think the lab, the, that LRA theoretical yield thing, a lot of you probably struggled with looking at those structures and being like, well, how do I calculate? We don't care how do you calculate anything or balance it. It's just that those shapes show up the same on both sides. If they did, we're okay. We're done. We move on. We don't have to stress necessarily about the exact chemical makeup of all of those individual pieces. Right? This is a simplification that helps us within OCHEM right? in particular because OCHEM is silly and simple. Feel free to quote me on that at the end of the semester. Okay? 
So, what else did you guys draw? Just for the record, so that you guys know that you're not crazy and that you did a good job. Hopefully you drew something like that. That is perfectly valid and acceptable. Okay, to answer this question. There was another answer that was drawn out there. Let's see if I can do it right. Uh, did I do it right? If you're willing to volunteer, now that we're talking about a wrong answer. I think I've got it. Does this satisfy our rule sets? Do we have three carbons? Yes. Do we have eight hydrogens? Yes. Do we have an oxygen? Yes. Yeah. Do we have 26 electrons drawn in this? No. Oh, no, we only have 24. Uh, it's because of the double bond. So this one doesn't work because we come up short on the electrons. It's 24 electrons, and we needed 26. Okay. A potential solution, oh, I'll just draw a pair of electrons on it. Okay. Now I've exceeded the octet on that oxygen. That doesn't work. Okay. The next thing that we can kind of get behind this is let's just ignore all of that and ignore the fact that we were trying to match a particular formula. Is this structure a good structure? So we don't care that, about any formulas. Is this structure an acceptable structure? Yeah. And that becomes a more challenging question to nuance, and ultimately, no. Why? Remember the common bonding patterns that we're supposed to acknowledge. Carbon's supposed to have how many bonds? Two. Carbon's supposed to have how many Sorry. bonds? Four. Four. <laughs> Carbon. Do all of our carbons have four bonds? Yeah. Yes. Oxygen's supposed to have how many bonds? Two. Two. It has way more than that. Why is that bad? It's going to change its formal charge. Ah. If we go through and now look at the formal charge for that oxygen, things get really, really, really wonky. Okay? And that becomes the problem with this drawing. Okay? Theoretically, what we would go through and do is have spent a bunch of time trying to draw all these different formulas and structures and Lewis things to figure out those common bonding patterns and have to internalize that for the most part. Okay? That requires lots and lots of practice that you typically don't have time for, which is why I would again, I need to figure that out, um, why again I would push really, really hard and stress that you need to memorize the common bonding patterns for those elements. So that when they show up, you aren't trying to draw these structures because you already know the common bonding pattern. Oxygen is supposed to have two bonds and two lone pairs. It can vary. It could have three bonds, but then it becomes positively charged. If it had four bonds, what happens? It becomes even more positive. Why do I want oxygen to not be positive? Partly. Why is having a positive oxygen, generally speaking, very high energy? What do you know about oxygen? And for everybody looking at the board or just trying to think through it, you're doing the wrong thing. What Nate did was a phenomenal thing. What did you just do? You looked at the periodic table because what information do we have stashed within the periodic table about our oxygen? You may not remember that part, but you at least got the pattern right, which is good. What information is stashed in the periodic table about our oxygen? Number of electrons, number of valence electrons. Yeah. Electronegativity. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element on the periodic table. What is electronegativity? The likelihood of taking electrons. The likelihood of holding bonding electrons, which means no bonds. Oxygen, as far as we're concerned, because we rarely see fluorine, should be negative or neutral. 
it should never go positive. Right? Can we make it go positive? Yes. Can we make it go doubly positive? That's where we're now really breaking things within our understanding of chemical bonding, and that's for a way different advanced class. Right? Because now you're trying to break the patterns. Make sense? All right. So again, I want to really call attention to this slide. I, if assuming that page number is actually right, okay, slide 38 is a pretty critical slide to have nailed down when we're talking about Lewis structure. Okay, when are we going to talk about Lewis structure? All the time. Everything we do is a Lewis structure, okay? which means you have to know those common bonding patterns. You either have those memorized and you're comfortable with them, um, from memorization, or you've done enough drawings to have internalized those common bonding patterns. Make sense? Okay. So, back with our Vesper, what we could then go through and do is start to predict something about shape, which is the intent of Vesper. So if we went through and drew out the structure that you all had, we'll stick with that one. We could now have a discussion about shape. When you look at the shape of your drawing, what shape, how would you describe that shape? A chain. A chain? But a chain can take up a whole bunch of different shapes, right? So I'm a little shaky on chain. You would describe it as linear based on the drawing. Okay, based off of our drawing, it looks linear. But I could take a chain and I could make a chain look linear. But what could a chain do? Turn. We could turn and bend that and it would then look different in my drawing. Can my drawing turn and bend? That's an interesting one that we're going to probe at in a little bit. It turns out that yes, it can. So when we looked at, when I drew it, I drew the oxygen. I got to remember we're recording this. The way you drew the oxygen is there instead of the hydrogen, right? And we kind of bent and did that shape, right? When we look at our Lewis structure, as long as we're drawing single lines, it doesn't matter any at all where we're placing them as long as we've accounted for all of those bonding patterns properly. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So, looks linear. What shape is it? So theoretically, in Chem 130, you drew a Lewis structure, and then we asked the question, what is the shape for this structure? Yes? Okay. So what is the shape? This is a challenging question. When we asked the question, what is the shape, back in Chem 130, what did we have very clearly identified? A center atom. Do we have a clear center atom? No. Okay. So asking the shape of a molecule is rude. Okay. I would argue rude in, in the best of case. Well, in the worst of cases, in the best of cases, it was in misleading, accidentally. So when we're asking for the shape, what you have to go through and do is identify your center atom. So when you say tetrahedral, what are you saying is tetrahedral within this molecule? The first carbon. This very first carbon is tetrahedral. Why? Because of the, oh wait. Mm. Yes? You still gotta do the why. I'm just trying to give you confidence that you're right. <laughs> the, the four bonds. Okay. What you're doing is looking at that carbon saying, are those electrons? Are those electrons? Are those electrons? Are those electrons? Yeah, so there's four groups of electrons. When I have four groups of electrons, I'm looking at a tetrahedral shape. That's what this is trying to show. There's some extra information in here that we're going to have to double back to in a little bit. But what we're trying to show is four groups of electrons, and that is tetrahedral. Phenomenal. I just want to press and see if maybe you've got a little bit more to, to add on that. You balked. You didn't quite like saying that. Why? I started second guessing myself. Which part? 
Yeah, okay. So you're seeing those as groups of electrons, and then you're seeing that one, and you're seeing that one as, well, why would that one matter? Why is that weird to you? I think because it's not a hydrogen. Perfect. It's not perfectly symmetric. It's not exactly the same. Okay. Is it still a group of electrons? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it still a bond? Mm -hmm. Yes. So in the simplest form, we can't differentiate it. It's still tetrahedral. Is that different bond going to change how all of those atoms orient? Yes, it will. Is that orientation an important thing to note for you? Probably. Thankfully, no. Okay. You don't need to stress about it. Okay? There will be cases where we'll probably come back and talk about it and be like, remember when we talked about shape and we had this conversation with Jennifer and we're going through it? This is where it kind of manifests. We don't have to know that per se, but this is how it's happening. Okay? So you're absolutely right in noting it. It's, it's not relevant enough for us to be concerned about. Okay? Anybody else want to give me a shape? Sure, what do you want to give me? Oxygen is bent. Okay, so now if you're now saying oxygen is my center atom, why are you saying it's bent? Because I see linear, trigonal, planar, and tetrahedral, so I'm very confused. It has two pairs of bonded electrons and two pairs of non-bonded electrons. When we look at the electrons around that oxygen, we're just looking at each of those, uh, pretend that square again, each of the faces and saying there are electrons on that face which means there are four groups of electrons, which would say tetrahedral. But you are now adding a layer saying that they aren't all the same. Some of them are bonding, some of them are non-bonding. How do I know that? The drawing, the lines, the dots. Lines versus dots. Our drawing helps to accent that information. Using that, I can note that it becomes more of a bent shape, where I'm seeing a pair of electrons that's not in a bond, hence dots, versus a pair of electrons in a bond lines. Note here they're showing wedges and dashes. Why are they showing wedges and dashes? The dash is the furthest away from you, and the solid one is the one closest to you. So that wedge is saying it's coming at you. The dash is saying it's going away. Okay. The other way that we could draw this would have just been this. Oxygen, there's our carbon, there's our hydrogen, and we could show our dots up there. No need for wedges and dashes. What did we do to do that? I right, said so another way, if the iPad is the fancy drawing, as opposed to my stupid drawing. Fancy drawing, the front of the iPad is that one, the back of the iPad is that one, right? You're looking at it like that. Everybody see? How did I get it to look like that? That was it. Changing my viewpoint on the molecule changes how I draw it. Whoa. Okay. That's one of the big things that we're going to push on when we're looking at our drawings. That's why we have Hayworth. That's why we have Fisher. That's why we have Newman. Those are all different viewpoints on the exact same molecule that give us slightly different information that allow us to draw different conclusions. So we need to be aware of those permutations and to realize those are one and the same as far as a drawing. Kind of, sort of? Okay. When um, we're talking about shape, we're only talking about molecular shape. We're not even including electron groups and the whatever it's, it is, you know, electron geometry. Okay, so just for the recording, because I doubt that went through. When we're talking about shape, we're talking about molecular shape. We don't care about electron shape or electron geometry. I just deleted everything. Did we talk about molecular shape? Yes. What was the molecular shape for that compound? Well, was that. So a single compound had a single molecular shape of tetrahedral and bent? No. No. Do we talk about molecular shape? We talk about atom shape within said molecule. Okay. So that's going to be our first distinction. The next part, 
Do we care about electron geometry or molecular shape? We care about both. Okay. The biggest one or the easiest one that manifests for us is molecular shape. Okay. So when we're drawing things out, we tend to ignore the electrons. But if I entirely ignore the electrons for hydrogen, or sorry, for oxygen, what shape does water look like? Linear. Linear. It's not linear. It's bent. Why is it bent? Because it has those electrons. This drawing, I would then acknowledge, is a bad drawing, and I should instead show it more like this, where it shows more of that bent shape. Okay? So when we talk about shape, we can't really avoid electron shape. We can't really just talk about molecular shape. Because molecular shape is really just referring to the bonds. We have to know that our non-bonds are there to force those shapes. Does that make sense? Yeah. In asking questions, which would I ask about? So if I had a test question, what is the geometry for water? Number one, I wouldn't say what is the geometry for water because that's not clear. Are we talking about molecular or are we talking about electron? I would probably preference molecular. Could I ask electron? Yes. You're responsible for both. Molecular is the more important one for what we're doing. Is that a very cagey answer to your question? No, it makes sense. So as far as our shapes go, this table just kind of puts it all together. This table is also adding this interesting thing about hybridization, and we're seeing this bond angle thing come up. The bond angle thing, I would like to say I don't think I would ask any questions on because I don't think it's all that important. Um, but they are there. We did talk a little bit how it changes. That as a question I think I would ask. Okay. As we move from tetrahedral to trigonal pyramidal, the bond angle changes. Why? That's a fair question. I don't care that you know the number. Why does it change? Because of the number of non bond electron groups. Why does that cause it to change? Electrons repulse each other. So if I have a tetrahedral shape, cool, nice and tetrahedral. If I make that a non-bonding pair, what does that do to the shape? Pushes everything even more further. Not further oh. apart, closer together. Why does it go closer together? Where are the electrons in a lone pair held versus the electrons in a bond? A lone pair is held on the atom. The bond is by definition shared. It's further away. So if I have electrons... If we say tetrahedral, and I now take those electrons and drop them closer to the atom, these have to repel away from it. That causes the bond angle to shrink. What happens if I remove those electrons? They spread out. Okay? That is a very challenging question. I would argue that probably pushes more into an extra credit question for an exam. Okay? Multiple choice, I could say, does it get bigger or smaller? That kind of thing. Because I'm not asking the why. I'm just saying, what does it do? Okay? Make sense? Okay. So drawing our organic molecules. If we had the formula C5H12, we just kind of address this. If we draw out that Lewis structure, okay, what we might get is the Lewis structure where it was all drawn in a chain, right? For... Five. And if I asked you to draw that, you'd probably be like, that's obnoxious, I don't want to have to draw all that, and you might do the exact same thing I did, but what I did isn't proper, right? What's wrong with it? I didn't draw all the hydrogen, so I'd have to go back through and draw all the hydrogens, and that's tedious and obnoxious, we don't want to do that. What makes it even more tedious and obnoxious is that if we then advanced the slide a little bit and removed the box, okay, we could go through and write our formula slightly differently. We could write it as a structural formula. Is what I drew appropriate to the structural formula? I'm just going to say you got to pretend there's hydrogens out there. I don't want to draw them all. Does my drawing match the structural formula? Yes. And that becomes kind of a hard one to deal with. Okay, we could go through and just count carbons. 
one, ooh, there's a subscript, which means two, three, four, five. That's the formula there, C5. H12, three, but there's two of them, which means six, six seven, eight, nine, plus three, there's 12. So that totaled up, right? Okay. Does this match that? So this structural formula matches that formula. This matches that formula. Does the structural formula match the drawing? How many CH3s are there? Two. Two. How many CH3s are there? Try again. Four. Three. <laughs> three. There's a CH3 out here, and there's two over here. How many CH3s in my drawing? Two. There's only two. The structural formula provides me slightly more information to say something about the structure. Enough so that the drawing that I've provided for C5H12 is now wrong. Okay. So how could I get to the proper or desired structure from the structural formula? We'll read left to right. The first thing we see is parentheses, which I would argue means I have two parentheses. Okay, which I know looks a bit silly. But what's within those parentheses? CH3. A carbon with three hydrogens. A carbon with three hydrogens. How many bonds should a carbon have? Four. Four. How many do we have shown? Three. Three. Which means we need an extra line to an atom. Because of these parentheses, what we're saying is that those parentheses are next to the very next thing in the list, which is carbon. All right, we'll come back to the H in a second, which then means we've got carbon right there. How many bonds should the carbon have? Four. Four. So we could show in those four bonds. Of those four bonds, we know one of them is a hydrogen. We know the other one must be the next carbon in the list. Why did I not put the carbon connected to the hydrogen? Because if we follow our patterns, carbon, hydrogen, shouldn't the next atom be connected backwards? It should, except... You can't connect more than one. Hydrogen can only have one bond, which means having it bond out to the carbon didn't make sense. Okay. How many bonds should carbon have? Four, so we again can throw, show in our extra three bonds because we already had one shown. Two of them we know are hydrogens. So we could show our hydrogens. Okay, what's the next one? Well, I've already shown my hydrogens. That last one must be the last carbon in the list. And then four bonds, there's my hydrogens. What I now have is the Lewis structure that represents that structural formula that is what I was fishing for within the formula, but the formula didn't provide me enough context to be able to interpret it. So what do you have to do as a student? Officially, interpret both formula and structural formulas. Structural formulas become more relevant because they give us more information than a formula. Are they easy to read? No, so at sucks. ideally we don't look at structural formulas. Why do we have structural formulas? Doesn't this drawing tell me how they're structured? Why do I have a structural formula? Okay, we'll come back to you. It's Devin's fault, it's Jennifer's fault, it's Nate's fault. Why do we have structural formulas? Whoop. And Alina's fault. What do the four of them have in common that the rest of you do not? Why do we have structural formulas? Because we write papers through a computer. Is it easy? to draw this structure in a computer. No. So what do we do? We invent a notation that allows me to encode all of that information in a way that is easier for me to type into a computer. 
Structural formulas are valuable for only the typewritten language. Right? Are our drawing capabilities getting to the level where we don't need to worry about how to type it or draw it? Because we could just draw it? Yes. As technology advances, structural formulas will probably disappear from utility. Why are they still here? There's a lot of very old chemists that were forced to learn it, and they are insanely bitter and force everybody else to learn it. There might be some other reason, but that's the only reason I see. Okay? Yes, before I delete stuff. Does the order of those two things matter with respect to the hydrogen? What's my name? Doesn't matter. No. But if my arm was attached to my head, would that matter? Yeah. So as long as you have those connected to the proper atom, that's all that really matters. Okay? Um, and what we'll see is that as we kind of advance our technology or our drawing capabilities, okay, we can get our Lewis structures. We can add in Vesper. Vesper is recognizing all of those shapes, which is going to necessitate wedges and dashes. Does that look pretty to you? No, that looks awful. I wish we had a shorthand. What was our shorthand? Structural formula hides all the bonding, right? We have to interpret it. At least the drawing gives us that information. Hide the carbons. Get rid of the C's and just say every point is a C. Now I can imply the presence of carbons. And for people being like, that still doesn't look very clean, what else could we do? Imply all of the hydrogens. This is where we spend our time. That's where we exist. That information right there in our line angle abbreviated format includes everything else above it. And depending on what we are asked, you have to internally translate all of that background knowledge into that structure. Yay. That's why people talk about OCHEM being hard. We're trying to manipulate a three-dimensional drawing and we want it simplified because it looks freaking awful from the beginning. So we try to make it look prettier. The instant we make it look prettier removes a lot of information that now we are required to have memorized. Okay? Or required to have the skills to interpret. Make sense? Okay, you just went wide-eyed on me and you just went wide-eyed on me. Does that mean you don't understand or you're just like, oh my God, this has just exploded in difficulty? I just, I just don't know what I'm looking at yet. Yes. Okay. What is that? What, <laughs> what is this? Yeah. This is that. I know it's that. And that is that. And that is that. But okay. Just look at the line angle abbreviated and I'm like. What do we do with this? What we do with this then comes down to how we talk about chemical reactions and what we can manipulate. If we talk about what we can do with this, um, what am I drawing? Mm, I think I goofed that one. I think I need another ring. Nobody? Is that not looking familiar to anybody? Yeah. Cholesterol. Steroids. What we're looking at is now a molecular structure for compounds in the human body that are responsible for hormones, that are responsible for... Um, Heart disease. All organic chemistry is doing is saying, oh my God, look at the complexity that's out there. That is way too hard to talk about right yet. So let's simplify it down. Look at smaller molecules. Let's make sure we understand how to manipulate those so that when we scale up to these crazy things, it's not as big a leap. Okay? So our point is just to say, let's make it simple 
And you're like, simple? That last thing was simple. In comparison to a cholesterol molecule, yeah, it was very simple. Okay? But give you the language skills so that when you look at a cholesterol or you look at a steroid, that you know what's going on within those and you can understand how they could manifest in different scenarios and generate different toxicities and reactivities. Okay? So really what you're saying when we... S a little nervous about why I did that. Um, what we're saying is, well, what is this? This is just a simple version to get us going and saying what we're looking at. That's it. We now need to start talking about what we can do with that structure. Do you really want to jump into what we can do with that structure? Have you had any practice dealing with this yet? You need more practice just on how do I draw this thing and understand where those things are and what that means before we start looking at what we do with it. Okay? So you're right. This seems like, well, why do I care? We don't care necessarily yet. We need to understand what those things are before we can actually start doing anything with them. Okay. So, our organic simplifications. This was the stuff we just kind of walked through. You need to know this, because this is taking our Lewis structure and saying we aren't going to worry about a lot of this stuff. So number one, with our Lewis structure, we only care about those elements. Halogens is technically a category, but if you're going to look for Lewis structure problems, if it's not one of those elements, don't do it. Okay? Because that's going to scale up the difficulty, maybe, and put you into exceeded octets. Okay? Simplified shapes and hybridizations. We aren't looking at, you know, beyond tetrahedral. We keep it simple. Abbreviated drawings. Our points are a carbon unless we say otherwise. Hydrogens are implied only to carbon and only to satisfy the octet. Okay? So if we go back... What? My thing went back. Why did the screen not go back? There it is. That's a carbon. How many electrons are shown to that carbon? Shown or implied? Shown. False. If you rewatch this at home, that carbon, how many electrons are shown to that carbon? Rhymes with shoe. Two right here. There's two electrons in that bond that are next to that carbon. So I've shown two electrons next to that carbon. What is the octet for carbon? Eight, Eight which means implied it's implied that there's three hydrogens connected to that carbon. That's an implication behind it. Does that mean every time I see a, another carbon, there's another red dot there, that I have three hydrogens? No. No? Why not? That has four electrons around it, which means two, two implied hydrogens. Okay? So we will imply hydrogens to carbon atoms to satisfy the octet. Okay? Charges will never be implied and are always shown. Okay? You can't just say, oh, that's a, negative, that's a negative carbon, just because it doesn't have its octet shown. Because you implied hydrogens, you can't imply electrons. Okay? And in particular, charges. Nitrogen, oxygen, and our allogens will unfortunately often have implied non-bonding electrons to satisfy their octet. That is dangerous. It is something that I will try desperately to not do in the sake of this class. You're just learning to speak the language. Implying electrons on those is a very problematic system. Okay? But organic chemists will notoriously do that, and by the end of the semester, we will probably stop drawing them because it's obnoxious to draw the dots. What three elements? Say that again? Oh, it says eight elements. So what elements are elements? Oh, did I not count them all out? Maybe I counted eight wrong. Our halogens are the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, so within that... I'm just going to now have to count it because you asked a good question. One, two, three, four, five. And then halogens are technically fluorine, chlorine, that's a Cl, bromine, and iodine. Guess where my six picks up? Six, seven, eight. And I didn't count fluorine. 
Fluorine typically doesn't show up very often, which is why I don't count it within my total. It just has to do with its reactivity. For instance, if we put fluorine with an organic molecule, guess what happens? Kaboom. It's an explosion. So elemental fluorine is so reactive within organic molecules, it's just going to destroy everything. So I ignore it. Okay. Fluoride, slightly different scenario from fluorine, that could show up it just very infrequently, largely because how'd you get it in there? Usually kaboom. Make sense? I know you're going to hate me. Yes, you can sigh at me. Where do our electrons exist? We talked about our electrons existing in atomic orbitals, right? If we look at CH4, we've got a bit of a problem. All of those bonds are identical, right? So if we drew this better, we need wedge and we need a dash to imply the three-dimensionality behind that. Yeah? Which means the bond angle there turns out to not be 90. It turns out to all be the same at 109.5. How do we know it's 109.5? We studied geometry. I didn't study geometry well enough. But I just trust that a geometrist sure, told me that it's 109.5. Why is that problematic? What is the bond angle between each of my p orbitals? As a hint, one of the p orbitals is on the x-axis. The other one's on the y-axis. What is the angle between those two axes? 90. The yeah, angle between the z-axis and the y-axis, or the x-axis? It's going to be something else. 90. What? It's all 90. Okay. We throw in the s-orbital. What's the bond angle between a sphere and an axis? Uh, there isn't one. They overlap. Like That doesn't make any sense. Why is this problematic? If we look at carbon, it's got four valence electrons, okay, which makes sense with our orbitals. We could put in four places to form bonds. The question is, where do we put them? If we're putting our electrons to make that molecule into those orbitals, that's where the orbital aligns, which means that's where the bond forms. Why is that problematic? That means the bonds that form should be 90 degrees away from each other, 90 degrees away from each other, and what the flip? What is the reality? 109.5. 109.5. So reality does not match with my atomic theory which makes sense because we call it atomic theory for a reason. It references uh, atoms. We're now looking at molecules. molecules. The theory has to be mutated. There are a variety of ways to mutate it. The easiest way to mutate it, and it's a little bit weird, is effectively magic. Someone went through and said, I need four equivalent orbitals. I start with four atomic orbitals. So we treat each of those atomic orbitals like Play-Doh. And I say, I start with four things, I need four new things. One pot, mix them all together, and I divide it out into four equal things, and I create new shapes out of them. That's hybridization theory. Okay? So within that, what that will generate then is some molecular orbitals. These new orbitals have to have a name. That name can be anything we want. The name that we picked for those orbitals had to do with what orbitals made them. If I take all four of these orbitals and I mix them all up, I need to create four new orbitals. All of those orbitals have to be identical. What do I want to call those new orbitals? SP. I don't actually call them SP. I call them SP3. Why? I used one s orbital and I used three p orbitals to make each of those. So I call them sp3. What if I use one s orbital and two p orbitals? Sp2. Sp2. And what's left over? An unused p orbital. 
So I generate three new orbitals, because I put three together, I get three out, and I get one left over. What if I take one S and one P? SP. SP. What does this ultimately mean for us? This is actually going to dictate all of our shapes. How do we arrange four equivalent orbitals around each other? Like a tetrahedron. How do we arrange three equivalent orbitals around each other? Trigonal planar. How do we arrange two equivalent orbitals? Linear. Okay. Definitely pack up, I understand. I apologize. I am just going back to that chart because that chart had some information in it. Oh my good God, where is it? Come back here. See that hybridization mark? SP was for the linear shape. The trigonal planar was SP2. So if you know the shape, you know the hybridization. Pretty powerful. Right? Because what's going to happen is now instead of saying what is the shape for each of those carbons, what we'll say is what's its hybridization. Okay? That will manifest in reactivity and all that other fun stuff. Of course, I'm still behind. So we'll pick.